having done it. And if you'd like to, we can we can start the meeting. Okay. Well, I would just like to welcome everyone. Um, the idea for this meeting really came out of the uh, finance subcommittee. We meet periodically, and uh, we were kind of reminiscing back to two years ago when we had our uh, school board uh, town council joint meeting, and uh, what a what a positive experience we thought it was, and uh, that it would be um, probably a good thing as we start our budget season to all get together again um, to meet each other and to talk about our procedures and um, other things of interest as we move forward. So um, I will go around and let uh, school board members introduce themselves. So I can't see everybody, but Heather, let's start with you. Do you just want to introduce yourself? Hi, Heather Altenberg, the chair. Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Seifries, no longer finance chair. <laughs> uh, Phil? Yeah, hi, I'm Phil Saucier, and somehow I am the finance chair this year. <laughs> uh, Laura's not here. Cindy? I am Cindy Boltz. Uh, this is my first year on the board. And Jen? Ken McVeigh, not on the finance at all. <laughs> <laughs> and Marcy? I, you're somewhere along here. Is Marcy still on? She might have bumped off. She just, she bumped, she just disappeared. She just yeah. disappeared. Okay. She, well, and I forgot to introduce down. myself, but I, I'm Donna Wolfram. I'm the uh, school superintendent. We'll we'll introduce Marcy when she pops back in. Yeah. Yeah, there she is. Back on. <clears throat> there she is. Back in action. Marcy, Sorry. do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Thank you, Donna. Um, um, I'm Marcia Weeks. I'm the business manager for the school department, and I'm happy to be here. And I'm excited about our budget process this winter slash spring. Great. So Matt, do you want to take over from there? Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. I'm Matt Sturgis and I am your town manager. And uh, I, I, I share Superintendent Wolfram's opinion. I think that uh, the communication and work between the, two, the council and the school board was, has, has been super the past couple of years as uh, both, both groups have collaborated and tried to work in an open communication strategy uh, to move forward with the town's goals. And uh, realizing that we do have, you know, we are in many ways a, a one town concept with uh, so many different shared services that we do have. And it's to the benefit of the taxpayers of the community as well as to the organization to have that crossover. So uh, really look at this process as one that we, we start early and uh, work through and try to look at our shared, uh, or at least the, uh, at least the town's shared uh, desires to provide uh, the best quality services at the most efficient uh, price point, I guess, in many different ways, but also uh, trying to pr provide the best that we can for the community. So with that being said, I'll, I'll step out of the way and uh, we can go through, uh, I'll introduce Jamie Garvin, who is this year's town council chair. Thanks, Matt. Um, good to see all of you. Looking forward to working together this year. Um, as Matt said, Jamie Garvin, current chair, uh, third time doing that uh, in my sixth year now on the council. And this year's finance chairman um, is Jeremy Gabrielson. Hi, I'm Jeremy Gabrielson, third year on the board, first year as finance chair. So I'm looking forward to seeing some more of those of you on the finance meetings. And from this point, I'll try to go in an alphabetical order, <laughs> which seems to be easiest for me, <laughs> looking at my scorecard to the right. And uh, Nicole Boucher is our, one of our new council members. Hey, everyone. I'm Nicole. And next we will have, uh, let's see, Penny Jordan. Penny Jordan, I'm lucky enough not to be a finance chair. <laughs> and I'm lucky enough to not understand my alphabet. So I'll be next moving over to Councillor Valerie Devereaux. <laughs> I'm Valerie Valerie. Devereaux, my um, third year and I am not on the finance, on, well, on the finance committee, I'm not a finance chair. <laughs> And Councilor Gretchen Noonan, also one of our new council members. Yep. Hi, everyone. Gretchen, and as Matt just said, I just joined in December. And 
And that's that's all I have at this point on if we want to move on uh, to uh, Chairman uh, Chairman Altenberg to talk about the roles and responsibilities of each group. Right, Heather, do you do you have that to share? Oh, we can hear you muted. Uh, that sheet of the different roles. I don't, and I thought. I, I think if if Matt can make me uh, give me the ability to share, I think I can. Whoops. And so you Matt. should be should be able to share now, Donna. I got you as a co-host. All right, this <clears throat> may take a moment. <clears throat> This may be a good opportunity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went through this. <clears throat> oh, yes, Matt. Screen. <laughs> Is this what you were talking about? No, but I love that. Go yeah, ahead. I've saved this since the original conversation, and uh, I'd be happy to try to re reproduce this and, and distribute to the group. But sure, kind of shows... that's one of our favorite things, Matt. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a pretty. I don't know. I find it. Very useful at different times of the year and for it's not even different reasons. Current, and it's that big. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this goes up to the two thousands. When does uh, it start? Uh, Nineteen hundred. So it gives you about a hundred years worth of uh, history of all the different mandates uh, that were that had taken place over the years. So what I'll try to do is copy this and uh, and distribute it to the group, and uh, it'll come out kind of part. You know, it'll be parted, but it'll at least it'll show the uh, show the language of of what the challenge is that you know we all have to <clears throat> ultimately face and acutely the schools end up having to face uh, from that side of it. I mean, the town, we have our, our own different areas that have been mandated through federal and state requirements, but uh, you may find that, unfortunately for the school board members, you may find it daunting uh, going forward. So uh, well, Donna, I'll take a bunch of things, time there. One of the things that really shows Matt is, um, with all of these mandates, many of these um, implications for staffing and for spacing, because there are so many um, mandates where um, a specialist has to work with a, either individual students or a small group of students. So um, a lot of those mandates have, um, have really big financial implications for us as, um, as a school district. I also think if I can interrupt that, I think one of the uh, powerful visuals of that fold out that Matt just showed is that when you're looking at the 1900s is, you know, there, the, the amount of requirements is like this big, you know, maybe two, three, four, five things. And when you get into the 2000s, it's like this much, you know, so all the things that are added that we're responsible for and that it's legal, um, like it's a legality. It's also a moral and ethical compass to take care of all the students in the district, but, but um, we're also legally bound. So uh, there used to be, when I started on the board, there was often this there would often be comments that would come from the public saying, well, well why do we have all these extra, um, extra, because 80 to 85% of our budget, we find out comes from our um, staffing and their benefits. And um, the staffing is so large, it's beyond the core, um, you know, math, English, science, history, because of these mandates and because it just, it, it's become a much more complex experience educating children. Um, and that's just an amazing uh, tool to see how that is, um, how that is true. So yeah, that would be great, Matt, because it is, and you will see it again throughout the budget season because we will bring it up at times for sure. So am I explaining this, Donna? Yes, you are, Heather. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to ask if I do get this wrong for other board members to chime in a little bit, but um, I think one of the things that is complicated about this budget season and that when I'm going to speak personally, this is my sixth year, when I, when I started, I didn't understand this. And I just think it's a good thing to review um, and understand um, where we come that, that because it, I think it gets a little confusing and complicated because the town council approves our budget before it can go forward to referendum. 
And so in some ways it feels like um, the town council is in charge of us as a school, but this chart showed us that, that we're, we're separate entities um, with the town council eventually supporting or negating that budget, you know, um, voting on whether to put it through or, or not. Um, and so this just goes ahead and explains the various roles and responsibilities. Um, so we've got on the left, we've got the, the town council, the police power, the general government. Um, and on the right, we have um, education. Um, and so the Department of Education, um, it's supervising the schools, um, it inspects the schools, it, schools, it enforces the education in law. And um, as I was mentioning before, it's, it's um, I think a lot of, and Donna, please correct me if I'm wrong on this statement, but I think a lot of the decisions with this best for the students at mind is sort of um, based around law, what is mandated and policy which is the policy is decided by um, board members and voted in by the board. And so that is a lot of what governs and decides, I think so much of what Donna as a superintendent does and it's what guides our school and then we set up goals and stuff like that. So I think that's a lot of what that's saying is, is there's, um, there's, there's the law that's behind um, what we do. Um, I think a lot of what is behind, um, well, I don't know, Matt, do you want to explain your side of things so that I don't get it wrong? Or do you want me to do my best and you can chime in? Uh, well, no, I'd, I'd be happy to if that'd be helpful. Uh, yeah, we can just go back and forth down a little bit. So, so as you go through uh, the left side of the, of, the, of the screen, you'll see the police power or general government, uh, and then uh, go steps down into charter. Charter is ultimately like the constitution of the town uh, and that identifies the different roles and responsibilities of the council, uh, as well as the manager, uh, lays out the roles and responsibilities even for, uh, for the education, what the school board's roles and responsibilities are, and it, it lays out all those different, uh, those different roles. And then from there, uh, and, and that's how the municipal corporation is, is organized. So uh, that's, that's pretty much its guiding, its guiding instrument. From there, the town council is the legislative authority within the community as well. And so they have the ability to pass laws, uh, oversee the operation of the community, and then uh, by, via the town manager and uh, providing me with goals, uh, direction, and uh, as well as uh, uh, establishing the, the ways that the town is looking to, to operate. And then uh, we, we graduate from down there through the general government and then the, uh, the different administrative tasks of the community and those are laid out under the town manager, as well as there are some sections that the town also sets, which are your different, uh, you know, your, your ordinances and, and local local rules. And I think that's about, that's your civics 101 uh, quick version for municipal government, if, that, if that's helpful. Yeah, and on the school board side, you know, um, we oversee our superintendent, um, and our three main functions are the superintendent to set policy and do our budget. Um, but then we have other tasks, um, you know, the buildings. Um, we um, also um, adopt the course of study. We hire teachers, but um, it, it's, um, yeah, we, we eventually vote and, and are the final hire for the teachers. Um, but um, so I think the reason that we appreciated this chart so much um, and it may seem simple to you, but there was a time um, where I don't think it was so clear between the town council and the school board is that um, the, the visual of it is that we are um, entities that interact. Obviously there's one, there's one budget, there's one tax that goes out to the, the people of Cape Elizabeth. And so we do have to work together, um, but we're not responsible for each other's um, we're not responsible for each other's budgets per se. And it gets confusing because the town council does vote and we understand that you are representatives of, um, of the townspeople. And so you're making these conscious efforts and you wanna support a budget that you believe in as well. Um, but I think there used to be this misnomer that, that the town council was in charge of the school board. And this just was a nice way to show that um, 
there is that vote, but other than that, we do have our own individual responsibilities. Does anybody from the board who's seen this before or anything want to add to that or Donna? Heather, you'll notice that uh, Elizabeth has her hand, her hand up. Oh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I think that part of the confusion, and I, I haven't um, been on the board for this, but I think it was shortly before I was on the board um, that new legislation passed, and it's not really new anymore, but um, the, the charter says that the um, town council needs to approve the budget. And um, it could be confusing right now because it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We send it out to referendum, the town gets to have it say, on whether or not it will support the school budget. However, Matt, do you know how many years ago, was it like 15? I mean, it's it's new in the realm of history of the town, but. Um, it's, close, it's close to that, it's back during the Baldacci administration. Yeah. Uh, so you're probably get, looking at a good 10 to 12 years. And yeah. that was one of the reforms that he brought in place or his administration passed into law. And that yep. was that you know, the town's uh, had the option at one point to, to decide to vote if they wanted to approve the, the town, uh, the school budget uh, via referendum in towns such as Cape Elizabeth, where previously it was approved by the town council. They would approve the council's, the, the town's budget as well as the school budget, and that would be the end of it. But then it, they decided that needed to have a further uh, discussion or further ratification by the voters, uh, at least for the for the education budget side, uh, which was quite common in, in in uh, your school departments that were like on a, were multiple schools, like an SAD or an RSU would have that because you had multiple towns that would have to be ratified uh, via the ballot box there. And then on occasion, and this is where I think it's every three years or four years, uh, the question comes back to the voters if they would like to maintain that status of approving the budget at uh, via referendum as well. So. Uh, but the, the town charter itself still maintains that the, the budget is approved by the council and then sent right. to referendum too. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a more or less an up or down vote, a much, much more clean question there where the council has then to do the heavy right. lift. But that's exactly why I brought it up because before that, that law went into effect, it really was the town council's job to try to take the temperature of the town and, and, really speak for the people of the town because the, the townspeople were not voting on the budget. And so it was really important for the town council at that time to um, not just think about, okay, did the school board do a thorough, rigorous and repeatable process? Did they, did they you know, manage this budget process in an appropriate and um, you know, transparent way, but they, the, the town council also had that responsibility of trying to, you know, think about all the townspeople. Um, whereas now, um, and we can, we, this isn't a forum for debate, but I think that the, you know, there's a whole, it's an old, kind of an old rule now left in the town charter that, that almost doesn't apply anymore because the townspeople have their vote. And so it's, it's, so it becomes very confusing, I think, to the public. I think we really have um, townspeople trying to lobby to subvert the process because they don't necessarily like the outcome of the vote, but the law is that we vote. So I think it's just kind of interesting and that has created confusion too. Um, but like Matt said, the law is really not new anymore. It's a good 10, 12 years old, but um, it's interesting. And I know that there has been some discussion, but I think changing charter seems to be a huge deal and I don't think I'd be getting involved in that one. So that's all I wanted to talk about. Any other questions or comments about this chart? Thanks. All right, I'm gonna stop and stop sharing but I need to share another um, piece. So let's see if we can make this happen. Oh, 
I think here it is. Great. Can everybody see that? No, you probably can't. Let's see. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I have to go back to this one. There we go. We're still not seeing anything. No, it's coming. Oh, okay. I promise. Okay. I can be patient. There we go. We got it. Draft. Okay. There we go. Oh, this is so exciting, Donna. <laughs> so we worked really hard in the last couple of years to um, to really nail down. And, and this, this really, a lot of this came from, um, this request came from, I think, Chris Straw, um, my first year, um, to really um, nail down what our budget development procedures were um, on the school department side. And we are next week, Monday, we have a policy meeting and um, we are starting to talk about um, turning this into actual policy um, for our uh, budget development uh, process so that we don't lose it. Uh, we wanted to document it memorialize it, they would say. Uh, so this is still in draft form and every time I look at it, I add something else, but uh, this is what we have so far. Uh, so in the fall, um, we, uh, two years ago out of the combined meeting, um, there was a suggestion made that we have a um, finance subcommittee made up of um, members of the, the school department and members of the, of the school board and um, the uh, business manager of the town and the school um, and um, members of town council and Matt and I. So we meet um, periodically, we try to meet once a month um, just for discussion about really what's going on um, on our side of the, the table as far as budget development um, or anything having to do with, with finance. And it's a very um, informal um, meeting, but uh, we usually have great discussion. And I think everyone leaves with a better understanding of what everyone else is, is doing. I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, uh, Matt, um, but I think it's been a really valuable um, meeting time for us. I think it has as well, just uh, to, to, you know, in many ways, just to identify uh, upcoming challenges as well as uh, larger elements that may, you know, be coming in the future, in the future, uh, in future budgets as well. So as well as just looking at, and if there was concerns that may exist there related to uh, revenues or expenditures and talking about those midstream. So you're, you're talking about halfway through the uh, annual budget at that point in time. So if there are uh, adjustments that, that need to be addressed, uh, it's a good forum right there to identify and uh, bring those back uh, from that meeting back to either the council or the school boards for, for a larger awareness. We've had some uh, some interesting projects come, um, come out of these meetings. Um, one was um, we went together on the generator um, for, um, for the school and uh, I think, I believe it, does it also run the library as well, some town uh, buildings? Uh, well, uh, we did it at the same time. We have, we have the library right. has its own generator and then the, and the, the new one at the middle school, but uh, we, we, that was a good opportunity for us to do that at the same time and get a decent purchase price, as well as uh, uh, a couple of different lease purchase options when we we're looking at busing, buses in the past and lining up some of those decisions so the, uh, so we don't have to duplicate uh, financial uh, procedures and spend more money to to you know to do a, to do that type of process. Right. So they they have um, been very valuable meetings. Um, so in November we actually start working on our budgets and um, the school administrators develop what we call original request budgets and. Um, those are budgets, um, what, what they feel they need to run their schools. And so we do call those original request budgets. And we also develop a budget schedule, um, which we do have posted. And the, by the third week of December, the original request budgets 
are due to be submitted to the school business manager. And then um, usually uh, over the vacation and into January, um, she puts those all together and really assembles the uh, original request budgets. And then in January, and we just did this um, a couple of weeks ago, the school board adopts school board budget goals. And there are four goals. I don't actually have them with me tonight, but um, there are four uh, school board budget goals that the school board did adopt. And they, they look at the budget goals every year and they, um, they usually tweak them a bit um, each year, depending on what's going on. Um, in the school department. And then at that point, I start writing what I call the budget updates. And after every meeting, I write a budget update, just it's a narrative. And I post, we post that on the district budget page. If you go to the school department website, you'll see um, a button that says um, FY22 budget. And we post all of our information right there. So it's really easy for the community members to uh, just go in and, and um, push that button. And anything they want, uh, anything that's happened with the budget is posted there. Um, our meetings are videotaped and, and posted there as well. So um, then uh, I, I um, Marcy and I have been meeting. Um, we meet individually with each school administrator um, and department head to uh, review original, the original request budgets. And we do it, you'll hear uh, the phrase line by line. We actually do go line by line through each um, administrator's budget request. We, looked at, we look at projected school enrollment. We look at the staffing numbers that will be needed to meet, um, to meet those, the student enrollment as well as any, um, any uh, staff that we need. Uh, sometimes we have students that come in that have special uh, needs and legally we are required to meet those needs. So it does influence our staffing. We might have to adjust our staffing a bit. So uh, we talk about that. Um, we talk about class sizes, the present class sizes and the projected class sizes, existing and new programs and facilities and maintenance needs. And we do go line by line and talk about any increases or decreases that we see. Often there might be um, some changes where things have been put in different, into different uh, categories, um, into different lines, um, depending on um, the purpose. And then in January, we have our school board workshop, which is happening next week and the Administrators will present their original request budgets to the school board. And then the school board members uh, don't ask questions that night. Uh, we found that we were having so many questions that it was really difficult to get through all of the presentations. Uh, it was taking two nights and we still weren't finished. So um, what we decided, and it, it's worked out really well for the last two years is that school board members, as the administrators are presenting, the school board members write down questions and um, then they, um, they give their questions um, in February, I'll skip down to February. They submit their questions to the school board finance chair and the, uh, the finance chair kind of collates all the questions and then they're sent out to the administrators who then you'll see later on um, present the answers. So through January and February, we continually adjust um, the original request budgets. We'll have version one, version two based on our different conversations and as we gain um, new information. Um, and we, um, continue to meet with the, um, the school board sub, uh, finance subcommittee uh, to present but, uh, budget updates. So in February, the questions are presented to the school board finance chair, and then uh, they are distributed to the school administrators and department's heads. And answers are presented then at, at the uh, budget workshops to the school board. Um, in February, we usually receive our um, notification regarding state subsidy, which is our ED 279. Uh, 
Um, I was at a superintendent's conference uh, just last week and they are going to try to get our state subsidy uh, reports to us uh, the last week in January, so next week. They said they're really gonna try hard to get them to us either Monday or Tuesday. So it's always an exciting time waiting to hear um, about our state subsidy. We continue with our school board budget workshops. And then in March, um, again, the subcommittee meets to talk about the uh, budget development process uh, on the town side and on the school side. And in March, uh, we the district receives our ceiling for health insurance increases. So we usually put a 10% holding place, 10% uh, increase uh, for health insurance. And then March is um, an exciting time when we find when we get that ceiling because sometimes then we can take it down if if the state ceiling is say eight percent, then we know we can reduce the the budget to. Uh, for health insurance increase to 8%. This, this is not a definite um, answer because we don't get that until April. We don't get our, um, our final increase, percentage increase. Uh, we continue to have budget conversations in our budget workshops and we're always talking about increases, decreases, health, the health insurance, what do we think it's going to be? And then finally, not until April, um, it really is, um, Right at the end, we received our notification of our actual uh, insurance increase. And um, that's always a good day when that goes down even below what, what the ceiling is. Uh, not a good day if it's higher than um, what we anticipated. Uh, the school board approves the budget, the school budget, and the school board presents the approved school budget to the town council for approval. And then in June, we have our public re referendum. So. Really, this is a um, documentation of, um, of how our budget process goes. I don't know if there's anybody on the school board that wants to make a comment or um, if there are any questions from anybody. I can't see all of you, so. Heather? Yeah, I would just like to say that um, Town council members are welcome at all of these or any of these. Um, I think one of the benefits um, that I have seen over the past few years with Donna is she does do really great updates. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, Donna, but I'm not sure if the town council receives those updates that you send to the school community and maybe we can um, make that happen. Um, no, we usually post them. So. Okay, so they usually get posted, but um, they're, they're really great summary of what's going on and really helpful. Um, and um, it's, it's great. Over the years, I've seen an increase of interest from town council members coming to watch our process so that when we do come to present it, it it's not brand new to everybody. Um, so you just please know that you're welcome. Yeah. Because I know you all want to go to more meetings, so why not? <laughs> or you could always watch them on video at, at your leisure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And Matt, it's your turn to talk about town council budget process. Oh, perfect. Uh, th thank you. I will. Uh, I'll be happy to. It's very similar. I, I will share my screen here. It's not as uh, uh, expanded of a document, so uh, but I, I'm happy to go through it. A few things that I do have is uh, what I have here is the timeline, and I think you'll find this, uh, I would say, very familiar uh, to what what's just. Uh, can you see that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for the uh, confirmation. So we're looking at here uh, right now, uh, or back in December, uh, the the our different departments provided me with all their different capital requests that they have for the upcoming year. And then uh, that has advanced to right uh, there all after that point, uh, after the holidays, working on their different departmental budgets, which are due to be delivered to me this Friday. Uh, so it's uh, so we're looking at a lot of different questions, and uh, but folks are starting to turn them in, and we're looking to get that document move forward. Uh, this timeline here was approved by the council back in December, and uh, we've posted it up there 
I shared it with uh, Jen Lackery, uh, who does a lot of the uh, school's um, calendar uh, calendar management, I guess, for lack of a better way to describe it. Uh, so she has, you, you should see those populated as well, uh, where you have where you have a need for that. Uh, but from there, over from the January 22nd on to, until March 5th, when I uh, deliver that to the town council, uh, we'll be working on the budget, uh, working with department heads, making changes where, uh, from what they request uh, to what uh, I think we want to bring forward to the council. And then on February 10th, uh, for the agenda at the council level, uh, I'll be asking them for direction as well as to where they uh, would like uh, to see the see the council uh, see the budget go uh, or in what direction. Obviously, uh, you know, I'd like to if there are some parameters. Usually, the question is regarding uh, if there's going to be a change in uh, compensation for the town employees, uh, for example, as well as uh, you know what we're looking at for growth is and identifying challenges that we will be looking at uh, in the upcoming budget. So council is starting to be aware of that. Uh, so we'll try to bring that forward at, at that point in time and then deliver the hard package itself on March 5th. And then uh, from there, uh, you'll notice that April 16th is the date that uh, that is the hard date by which the school needs to, del to deliver its uh, budget to, to the town council. And then we get that distributed at that point. And that's by charter. It lays out that it has to be at least 75 days prior uh, to the beginning of the budget year. So uh, that's that's a hard and fast date there as well. From there, uh, the council goes through, and the, the council is the entire uh, is the is the finance committee. So the finance committee is comprised as the council as a whole, and with Councilor Gabrielson as this year's finance chair, uh, he'll be running those meetings. Uh, and then we have, as you see right there, a layout on, on the different dates. So the week of March 15th, uh, we will go through all the different departmental uh, accounts and each department head will come in and make a presentation to the council regarding their, their upcoming budget, as well as capital needs that they may have identified. So they'll review those on those evenings. And so we'll have administration uh, through uh, fire department, public safety, uh, and then public works is, uh, is the following uh, later in the week. And then uh, from that point, it pretty much is handed over to the council. It becomes the council's document to, to, to direct me as to what they'd like to have for changes uh, that, that they identify, uh, as well as refining that, all, all with the, the, the stated goal of getting to final approval. Uh, but there will be different uh, conversations they'll have uh, on April 12th. We'll have uh, a regular council meeting. And then that's kind of a first, uh, first bite at the apple. Uh, by the public to provide public comments uh, to the budget at that evening's meeting. And then uh, and then, then you have school vacation week uh, identified. And then from there, we graduate to uh, the school coming in and doing their presentation from the school board to the council. And then the following evening, if there is a following question, if there are additional questions that may arise from, from the school budget, as well as there may be other lingering questions that need to be answered related to the municipal budget if there are still there uh, or if there, there may be final tweaking that needs to take place uh, that would, could take place on the 27th looking at having a public hearing the following week on may 3rd and that's uh that's the formal public hearing as required by charter uh, where the council will receive input from the general public uh, if they so desire to uh, provide their input relating to the budget, what they like, what they may not like, uh, or, or other input that they'd like to provide the council for decision. And then a week later is the uh, regular town council meeting and the formal vote on the uh, 2022 fiscal year budget. And then later in the month, uh, less than 30, or within 30 days uh, by, by state law and by charter, the citizens need to vote on the adoption of the school budget at that point in time. So that would be on Tuesday, June 8th, and that would be the municipal elections in June. So that's that's pretty much the run of the timeline that we have there. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing there. Uh, and I'll just take the opportunity to identify, there are a few different areas that we have uh, coming up this year on the municipal side for challenges. And uh, last week we were discussing council goals and looking uh, looking forward. There are some capital projects, as you may recall from last year, uh, that uh, you know, with the uncertainty of the pandemic, its impact on municipal finances, uh, revenues, expenses, and across the board, 
uh, we did the budget twice uh, last year and came with a strongly revised budget later in the spring. Uh, and then uh, all of the windows last spring, obviously, as you recall, expanded. Uh, there, were, there were later votes and uh, the ratification process was pushed off, uh, which was uh, by design from the executive uh, branch expanding those voting periods. But trying to figure out what might be coming uh, from different forms of relief and, and funding. Uh, but ultimately we came down with a very conservative budget that had a significant amount of capital projects that uh, were planned uh, to be pushed off to latter years. So uh, that's one of the challenges we are looking at in, in crafting this year's municipal budget. Uh, there were some projects such as uh, Kettle Cove drainage project that was put off uh, that had been in line for many years, uh, conversion to LED street lamps, uh, as well as uh, 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 some planning and engineering that we did on some of those. However, uh, there were larger ticket items uh, that also just had to, had to go off. There was a municipal revaluation that we put off and we're actually gonna have to put that off another year due to the pandemic because this will be no year for, you know, for a house to house uh, visit by the municipal assessor uh, for his safety, but as well as for the safety and security of, of, the, fine, of the fine citizens of town. Uh, so, but some of those will be coming back in this year's budget, and uh, we'll be looking at those as well. We, we'll be trying to find uh, other opportunities as well, uh, such as looking to find uh, grants where they are available. Uh, one of the projects that we did have scheduled for this year, which is a, a Willowbrook culvert replacement, which is a very significant project and one of, of a high level environmental concern uh, as we have uh, a, a drainage ditch that has a, a, a fairly large sewer line running over it and it's time for replacement. Uh, town planner Maureen O'Mara uh, worked diligently in pursuing grants and received a $375,000 grant uh, to have that replaced. And it'll be a much a far superior project uh, than what was originally designed, but with the lion's share of that funding coming from a grant. So that was a, that was a significantly <laughs> positive development that took place this year. Uh, there's also uh, uh, two collective bargaining agreements that will be renewed this year. So uh, we have initial contact made with uh, both uh, with both entities there, and that would be our policemen's union as well as the public works union. Those are three-year contracts that were negotiated three years ago, and uh, they they they've come up as as they do. Uh, we do have a positive uh, relationship with both entities, and I think. Uh, it's a heck of a challenge, as they know, uh, with the uncertain times that, that we're all in, because uh, they live it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think we do have a good positive relationship. I'm optimistic about those negotiations, and uh, but those will both be up this year. Uh, we'll also be pursuing, uh, where, where we do have larger ticket items, such as uh, uh, engine, let's see, engine one, I think, is lined up for repair uh, replacement this year. It's a 19-year-old uh, uh, truck that uh, by the time it, the new one would be made, it would be in excess of 20 years old. Uh, and Councilor Noonan can correct me if I'm wrong on the engine number, but I, I do know it's an engine that, that, uh, that Chief Policeman had put out there. So that's a preview, but we will we'll look for items such as that that are larger ticket. Uh, we've pursued in the past, uh, past four years, uh, uh, the approach of uh, lease purchase agreements that allow us to stretch the, the, the payment period over five years, for instance, at a low interest rate uh, that will allow us to enjoy, uh, enjoy that asset while also uh, having it for a much longer time than the period that it would be financed for. So we're looking to pursue that again in this, in this year's upcoming budget. That's helped us in the past to maintain a stable tax rate uh, from the town side by having lower, lower steady payments. Uh, we're also looking at the retirement of, uh, of some bonds uh, at the end of this year. So uh, that will be coming off the books. So that's a positive, uh, positive uh, point on the, on the budget. And I think that's the best uh, or the, the most I have at this point in time without going uh, too far on and on. So I'd be happy to take any questions as well. And if not, I'd be happy to rest my voice and move on to the next portion. <laughs> portion okay, of the, so uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk. I think that was the town, the town council perspective or the town perspective. So I'll, I'll move to the school um, perspective and what's going on in our side. 
Um, so there, we have been able to um, secure quite a few grants this year that Marcy and I have been beating the bushes every time something comes up, we try to jump on it. But um, we are, um, we will just be starting an, a million dollar plus project on ventilation, which is part of our federal, uh, a federal grant that, that became available to us to improve the, the ventilation. When we did our um, needs assessment, there were several um, concerns about ventilation. And as we, um, as we look at future building projects, but also realize that we have to have our students in our schools for probably five plus years before any new school might become available, um, if, if that is um, the plan. Um, and getting our students and our staff in our schools, more uh, all of our students back in our in our schools, that we just need to uh, read, have do these ventilation projects. Um, so they are um, they'll be starting in March. Um, so that's very exciting, and that's um, a lot of money <laughs> that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, you'll remember last year when we were um, meeting with you about the budget, we were so concerned about PPE and um, cleaning materials and would we have enough for those and, and we have gotten some, some grant money to, that funds those. Um, so we're in really good shape with our PPE and our cleaning materials. Um, also with all of the um, remote teaching that's going on now, especially at the high school, um, we have really ramped up our technology, which we've been able to do because of um, more federal grants. So um, we're to the point now at the high school where um, most of the students are getting direct instruction four days a week. Um, we have teachers who are teaching kids in their classroom and they're also teaching kids who are uh, zooming in um, uh, from home and uh, sometimes there are like three different screens going in a classroom plus microphones um, because we couldn't uh, we found that um, the students at home couldn't hear the the students uh, at in the classroom when they answered so we had to um, really uh, invest in some uh, some microphones so that everybody could hear what was going on in the classroom. So there are some amazing things going on. And um, we were fortunate enough to uh, have that technology funded through grant money. So um, uh, it's, it's been, it was a real blessing getting that grant money. One of the things that um, all of the schools in Maine are facing this year is uh, decreased enrollment. And, and this is specific to the COVID situation because we have students who are uh, being homeschooled um, for various reasons. We also have students who have gone to private schools because um, they don't have to uh, follow the guidelines that we have to follow. And many of our parents, I know in our district have said, as soon as our students get back in school full time, they will be uh, bringing their their students back to our district. But this is something that's going on um, all over Maine. It's not unique to us. And part of our funding formula for our subsidy is based on our enrollment. So the state has been working on um, how to um, not make uh, it so painful to schools throughout Maine um, because of this decreased enrollment. So they have, um, changed their formula a bit. We have ratios that we are supposed to follow. Um, one of the ratios is students to teachers. So they have changed the uh, student teacher ratio uh, for elementary students from 17 to one down to 16 to one in an attempt to try to level out the subsidy. So I think that's why one of the reasons we're all so interested in getting our subsidy reports next week to find out what this means to us as far as subsidy, because our subsidy is basically based on enrollment and valuation. Um, so, so I think that's the big, one of the big challenges that um, we're all facing, all schools are facing um, in Maine. We, had, we did secure a bus and a van 
from part of our uh, federal funding, our COVID funding. Um, so that has helped uh, as well. So, um, you know, we really are very thankful for, for that funding that we've gotten. So any questions? <laughs> we'll know more next week. Uh, I will provide a correction. It is engine two, not engine one. I oh, okay. for the, uh... <laughs> it's red, right? Is it red? <laughs> <We're> all red. <laughs> So I think we'll move on to, um, oh, we, we also do have two bar uh, collecting, collective bargaining um, units that we'll be meeting with this year. Um, last year we did settle with the teachers. So um, that was, that's the largest one. And um, so this year we have two. So we'll be getting started with that very shortly. So uh, Heather, do you wanna talk about the um, building committee process? Yes, I'm happy to. Um, gosh, where do we start? Uh, about four years ago when we had super in uh, the interim uh, superintendent Coulter, Howard Coulter, uh, we started uh, a process with the building committee to sort of look at our buildings. Um, and we ended up hiring Colby and company um, as our engineers and Simon architects to come in and just um, look at things and it originated from the safety viewpoint of um, the entry points of Pond Cove in the middle school and the cafetorium, uh, which is um, which is a cafeteria and a um, middle school theater. And their big line um, was, you know, it's like a sofa bed. It's not a sofa and it's not a bed and it doesn't do either really well. Um, and so uh, it, there's not enough space. There's multiple reasons why the cafetorium doesn't work. And as a result, our students, um, they, they have very short lunches. Some students are starting, I don't know the exact time, but like they're having lunch at like 10 o'clock. Um, yeah, people with younger kids. Um, my kids aren't there anymore, but it, it's, just, it's just not a healthy way to be going through your lunch experience. And so that's where the conversation started. And when you go through and you do an analysis in a project like this, you have to start to look at the whole picture. And um, there, were, there were some basic plans on how to make it bigger, but then you looked at the kitchen and then you looked at the different grades and then, um, and then we learned about the music room in, in the middle school and, and how, um, you know, there's, there's so little room there. And Caitlin Ramsey does an amazing job. And thank goodness she's organized, but we learned that, um, and that's how it's still successful, but um, all these things that are wrong with it and that kids have to wear coats because of the temperature or they're sweating or whatever. And so it just sort of snowballed into this, um, this, this um, recognition that we needed to do a needs assessment. And um, so we ended up hiring them a couple years ago and they went through and they did a needs assessment. Um, and it, it's quite a long document. It is available um, on our website and um, it talks about the different things that need to get fixed from a windowsill to, um, I don't know, to heat pumps, to, to all different things. And the way they structured it was in such a way, um, you know, they didn't want it to be this big, huge document that you would, you know, just put aside and not utilize. There are different projects on each page that, that have the information. So you can pick certain um, projects out that need to be done. And Perry um, has been working, our um, facilities manager has been working really hard over the years to try to do that. Um, I think, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Um, our budget, um, many years ago, uh, we got quite a bit of state subsidy that was cut two years in a row. And I believe it was like a million and a half over two years. And so what we did was we kept cutting our CIP, so our capital improvement budget, down, down, down until we got it to $250,000, which for a school district, like I could probably spend two hundred and fifty thousand on my house to like make it a little bit nicer, right? But on a whole school district, like that is so minimal. And as Perry Schwartz, our our um, facilities manager, said, it's like whack a mole. 
you know, he's doing his best to keep things going, but it, it's a building and, and we're responding and reacting. And um, so this needs assessment was organized in red, yellow, and green. And really these architects and engineers came up to us and um, explained to us that there, there were, and, and through the needs assessment, we recognize that um, though the, the, the cafetorium and the entryways are big deals for sure, they're not the only issues in our schools. And so we decided to step back, take a bigger look. We, um, for the past year about, we've had a building committee of about 35 people, parents, teachers, town council members, um, even had students on there, um, board members, um, administrators, um, and, and we uh, used Colby um, and company and Simon Architects to help us uh, navigate how, how to go about. And the, the charge for us was to come up with a recommendation for the school board. And we started with four um, sort of, uh, basic options, right? Not, not detailed at all um, from, um, you know, brand new buildings to renovations to just going to the cafetorium and the entryway route. And over conversations and, you know, Matt came and, and talked to us about bonding and, and, and money and, and the town's capacity and, um, and, you know, Simon Architect came in and answered a lot of our questions. We had a lot of discussion over the past year. There was a hiatus of quite a few months when um, COVID hit and during the summer, but we got started again in September um, and we kept the conversation going and, and, and started to take away certain options. And the recommendation that was brought to the school board and then voted unanimously um, by the school board was um, that we do need new buildings. They are, um, as Colby Company says, they're reaching the end of their life um, span. They 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 um, they explain to us very clearly um, the the challenges with renovations in buildings that we have. It, um, for example, just not to explain it too much, but. Um, if Pond Cove in the middle school were a nice square building that was four stories tall, we might be able to renovate it a little bit better because the outside, um, the footprint um, is workable, it's contained, there's less roofing. Um, sorry about the dog in the background. Um, <laughs> But ours is spread out and it's all sprawling and that's not ideal for the renovation. And that's just one um, slight example. So that, that helped us come to this conclusion. And so we did decide that um, we would like to, to move forward. Um, and the idea is to renovate Pond Cove and um, the middle school. Um, those are in our state, believe it or not. And that at some point, um, uh, and then it, uh, and then eventually knowing that the high school is not that far behind and actually, um, I'm texting my daughter to say, please come get the dog. Sorry. Um, uh, that, uh, the high school will need that renovation as well. Um, but the, we're trying to break it up so that they're not all being done at the same time. But as Donna did mention there, um, you know, even if we're in this process right now, we, um, you know, we're not going to have buildings tomorrow, even if we are getting new buildings, right? It's going to take the time. And so it is amazing that we have this grant, that we're able to put in some new ventilation, that we're able to do, we have to keep, I mean, our kids have to stay in school. So we are going to have to put money into these failing buildings because we need to keep them coming into school as best as possible. So, um, that's where we're headed. Uh, the, the, the next step in this whole process is to hire a firm to do a schematic design, which is a much more detailed analysis of what needs to be done so that we have um, better specs, better numbers, and they can come at us with this project is so large, it, it will have to be a bond and, and go out to the public. And there will have to be a lot of um, marketing and informational sessions and um, 
answering of questions and sort of selling the project if, if we believe in it, which I definitely do after all the meetings I've been in and the walkthroughs through the buildings. And um, it, it's just pretty incredible um, that the, the position they're in and the state that they're in right now. Um, and so um, we need to go for a bond. And in order to do that, we need a clear idea of what to expect. And right now it's just a basic idea. Um, and, and so that's where we're at at this point. We need to hire the right people. And I believe that is out. Yeah, so- I'm gonna uh, let you take over Donna at this point. So we put out a request for qualification. So there's a way that you have to, there's a proper way that you have to do this. So you have to put out a request for qualifications and you have to advertise um, through two advertising cycles. So it was advertised on Sunday, January 3rd. Um, and Sunday, January 10th in the Portland Press Herald and the Kennebec Journal. So architectural firms will, will read those requests for qualifications and always they're given an opportunity, they're given a number and they have an opportunity to ask, um, ask some questions. And I know Marcy did get some, um, some inquiries about that. Uh, the deadline, uh, and then they they send us their qualifications, they, the different ar architectural firms. So the deadline for these is uh, Friday the 29th by 10 o'clock. Um, and they are, they're very specific about how they have to present their qualifications. So they have to come in a sealed envelope with five copies. Um, and um, then the, um, the, um, the envelopes will all be opened. And we will arrange for interviews. Um, we'll have an interview panel and we'll, we'll interview the architects and make a decision um, about the architect. And then they will guide us moving forward. Whoever we select will guide us um, moving forward through the, the, pro the bonding process. And um, I know that Marcy's done some uh, research on um, how to pay for this schematic design because it's pretty expensive. So Marcy, do you want to talk a minute about that? Oh, yes. Thanks, Donna. So I've been in touch with uh, the town finance director and bond council for Cape Elizabeth so that, they're, that our team um, is ready for when uh, everyone's ready to move on and make action on this. And they advised me that the concept design expense will be a reimbursable cost through the bond issue. However, the timing is going to be critical. And uh, our team is there to help us make sure that we meet all the time limits because the clock starts ticking when both councils do a vote for um, a declaration, when a declaration of an intent for a bond issue, essentially. And then soft costs are reimbursable based on that time frame. So that's, um, the research I've done and uh, Bond Council is aware, I've sent them timeframes of what's happened so far with our RFQ process so that um, they're, they're aware of everything along the way and uh, as well as a town finance director. And the budget process will be the next step and I'll be able to present the uh, school board and Superintendent Wolfram with the options that we'll be facing with the budget process for the concept design. And I wanted to also add that as soon as the architectural engineering firm is selected, then that's when superintendent and school board will have the opportunity to negotiate the price for the concept design. I was, I've, I have talked to the um, state um, director for projects, for school projects. And he said that at that time, you can negotiate the price so that you have control, um, somewhat some control over that, that part. And then we'll know exactly what the price will be for the concept design. We have a placeholder in the budget at this time. And then from this point forward, everything can be negotiated uh, with all the councils and the firm selected. So that's where we are right now. Oh, are there any questions? Penny? Yes, um, I, I, um, I have a question on, um, is there a step in the process to 
um, kind of take the pulse of the town, whether the citizens have the appetite for uh, a major uh, project, renovation, uh, rework, redesign of the school campuses? There will be several um, community meetings um, that will be held to go over this, so. What happens in many projects, having managed several in my life, um, when the train leaves the station and uh, you start down a road and, um, and you, you make uh, investments along the way, such as uh, uh, engaging architects in a concept design, uh, basically you get a certain way down the road and um, you look back and you go, how much of that is a sunk cost? Because there's going to have to be a vote at some point in time uh, across the town of whether there is appetite for a major investment such as this. And so do you take the pulse of the, uh, the town now or do you wait uh, eight to 10 months, however many it might be, six months. Um, and then you invest more money in order to uh, price out the project, phase out the project. And the train is now probably halfway down the tracks. So that's, the, that's my question as to at, at what point do we take the uh, pulse of the town and whether there's appetite for major investment. So, I have a question. When we um, do the referendum in June, there's often questions um, about the budget. Would, was this budget high enough? Was it low enough? Um, can, can we add a question or something to... Uh, you know how the that's a wise idea. At least then you know where the barometer is and, and you can be doing some um, education and, uh, and visibility around the project before yeah. then. But uh, people are gonna see the trains left the station and they're going to get really antsy about it if they think that they don't have a voice in it. Right, and um, I just, Penny, I just want to communicate to you that in our conversations, we recognize that there's a lot of um, a lot of communicating that needs to be done, and there's a lot of educating that needs to be done, and that um, th th there's a lot of investment that has to go into to more than a regular budget, even you know, tenfold, twentyfold, a hundredfold to 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 keep the the townspeople. Um, abreast of what's going on. Like this is a big campaign, it, so to speak, an undertaking to to inform. Um, Huge, yeah. And 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 we're recognizing that. Um, so we're we're beginning those steps as well. So um, I have another question uh, regarding the bond piece, only because I'm really not a finance person. So, and I hear bonds and I see that as uh, taxpayer dollars also, uh, or we have to pay it back in some way, um, is tell me, explain to me the process, because we're going to be bonding something, the investment in the architectural uh, part of it. Explain to me a little bit more in on uh, layman's terms. Yeah, so I'm gonna, um, I don't know if this, I don't know if this helps, but maybe um, Matt can can pop in after I and, and follow up with more of the detail. Cause like you, I'm not the biggest finance person, but what I do, what I have understood and this might help you, Penny, is that um, our first steps, so so we have a goal, right? Our goal is, is to get these new buildings. This is the recommendation, this is the goal. I totally recognize that there's so much that happens in between that, that, that the townspeople and taking the pulse and all of that has to happen in between. There, there's a lot of details that um, I'm not gonna get into, but the, the basic idea is we need a schematic design to know what we're dealing with, to get into some of the nitty gritty, to know the finances and, and all of that and the time frame and all and everything. And so 
best case scenario, we, we do this marketing, we get this out, we, we've hired the architect and the engineer firm and we have it in our budget and we go to referendum and um, the, the budget passes and we're like, great, we've got that support from the townspeople. Let's just say we have the support from the townspeople so that we can move forward with this example. And then they start like as soon as the budget cycle begins in July, right? And and they go and they take their time time to, to create what they need, come up with actual bond. It's not until the next June, so the next cycle, that we will be able to put out a vote for a bond at that point. So we have then after that a whole, you know, a whole nother year to sort of talk this up, to educate, to explain. And then hopefully the bond will go through and, um, and it is money. This is where I'm gonna let Matt take over and explain that piece of how the bond works. We did spend quite a bit of time talking in our discussions about retired bonds, which Matt has spoken about a little bit earlier and taking this bond over. We did talk about um, our rating um, and how we do have the capacity as a town, we understand to take on a little bit of debt um, and to maybe lower a rating if it's going to give us these assets of new schools, which are not just good for the students, but which are good for everybody in the town um, on so many levels. So we, we, we had a lot of conversation about, about the finances, but Matt, I'm gonna let you um, take over at this point and see if you can answer Penny's question in a little bit more financial detail. Uh, yeah, yeah, at that point in time, I mean, if the, it would have due to the size of the uh, of the bond that you're be looking at, it would have to go to the voters and then to have it approved by them. Uh, so we'd have to work with bond council to have a full package uh, pulled together, and uh, and you know during that time period that you would be receiving, you know, I'd say harder numbers because you couldn't go in with a, a a soft number at that point in time. Uh, so you'd have firm estimates that you would have to go in with. And then the town, the town would then have to approve that uh, by vote. As you know, over a million dollars, uh, it has to be approved by the voters of the community. So uh, we'd be looking at that at that amount there. Uh, and then uh, I know Marcy had talked about other elements. If you wanted to uh, reimburse um, the operational side of it with uh, bond proceeds, say it, for instance, there was a couple hundred thousand dollars to do that uh, schematic. That you could put that, you know, that would be one of those costs that would be allowed to be reimbursed uh, on the school side of the equation uh, with the budget through the, through the approval of that bond. But uh, ultimately, you need to get the voters to to approve that, and that's the ultimate test when it comes to it. I also have another question, Matt, um, only because again, I, this isn't my area of expertise, but when it, whenever I hear uh, bond rating going uh, down, um, my understanding is your your the cost of the money, the cost of um, it impacts what your rate would be on the repayment of a bond. It's where your uh, rating is. Is that true? That's that's uh, perfectly accurate. Yeah, what you what you're not finding right now, we have, uh, you know, for the size of the town uh, and uh, what we have for assets, we have the highest bond rating that that is uh, currently available, uh, which is allows would allow us to you know to have the best rates available at the present time. And then if you you know then you are re uh, reevaluated, I guess would be the best way to look at it. If what as you take on more debt. That then would have an impact on your on your rating. It would be post this, but then in the future you may want to do uh, additional bonded items. Uh, at that point, you you know you might be looking at a, a rate that could be uh, a couple of basis points greater due to uh, if there was a change in the bond rating down uh, in a downward fashion. So I I I had a little schematic that I presented at the last uh, or the second to last building committee meeting, just kind of showing that how that progresses, but. It could have, it could have an impact at that point in time for future for future lending that or future borrowing that you want to do, but right now we do have uh, and, uh, speaking with John Quarteraro, our finance director, uh, yesterday about that as well. Just uh, uh, he had confirmed uh, that we are still uh, a double A, you know, 
basically we're gold standard when it comes to our rating at the present time. So as we try, as we get down to that point, we would probably have to look at uh, what does the next X number of years look like for other investments that would need uh, loans or bonding. So we need a full kind of assessment of what the horizon looks like, correct? Yes, and, and what you want to think about at that point, I mean, if, you, if there are other items that you were thinking about bonding at that time, uh, historically, the town has tried to do that uh, when they have gone out to bond for larger terms, you know, for longer terms than five years, which we've done with like a lease purchase approach, but anything in excess of 10 years, 20 years, uh, you want something that is going in there that is also going to have a life that's uh, equal to the length of the bond or greater, uh, because, you know, you wouldn't want to put, uh, you know, a, a plow truck in or, or a tow truck or, I'm no, sorry, tow truck, a pickup truck for public works in on a 30-year bond because, uh, 10 years down the road, the truck is gone and you still have 20 more years of debt. So, uh, but you could look at something that might be say a sewer system uh, expansion that would, you know, something like a hard, larger ticket infrastructure item, maybe what you want to look at there. Uh, best example locally from that would be Yarmouth and the work that they did. They took out a significant amount of bonds, I think in excess of $60 million uh, that they invested into the schools. And at the same time, they had an additional question for the town uh, for additional bonding. So they took that all, uh, they took a giant leap of faith at, at one point in time for lack of a better way to describe it, but it's 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 come on board this year. Debt, payment, debt service payment number one is in this upcoming budget. And I know uh, the manager in Yarmouth and I are, are fairly good friends and uh, you know it has an impact on their tax rate and it will for the next 30 years. So, uh, but they took, they bit the bullet all at once, but they did. If you do have the opportunity to combine them, uh, you would want to do that at that point in time. Okay. And just to follow up with one additional question, if I may, Penny. Um, so legally the town is the entity that would be floating the bond, not the, the school administrative district? Yes, you are, you are correct, Councilor Gabrielson. That's, uh, that ultimately comes down to the council, uh, you know, similar to the, the, to the schematic we saw earlier this evening. Uh, with, the, with the budget adoption by the council, uh, that also would go forward from the council, and then uh, they are the bonding authority uh, for the community. Well, with the voters' approval, sorry, uh, the, the ultimate approval when it comes to that. Much, much, much more to come on this. So it is a long, long process. <laughs> I ask a few more questions. Well, in general, um, only because I like to uh, think ahead. What, are, what do you see, Donna, as the, um, in a general budget perspective for the schools, uh, the school building aside, um, what do you see as the greatest challenges ahead for uh, this budget season, just so I kind of have it on my radar? Well, I've asked the administrators to keep their budgets as tight as they can um, we have a very few um, new positions or a tiny bit of time added to, to staff, uh, for staff. Um, one of the, I don't know if it's a challenge, but one of the things that we really need to do um, is um, look at our technology department um, as far as what we're teaching, our, our education and technology and um, our offerings that we have for students and, um, and really offer, offer students more in the area of technology. So that's one of the things that, that's one of the, the goals that, that we have um, for this year. Uh, we do have a few legal positions that we have to add in. So, you know, as always positions, positions are what impacts our budget the most. So, um, so that, that's always our challenge to, uh, to try to find a balance between, um, you know, while keeping in mind what's best for students, but also the balance between, um, you know, what, what is uh, fiscally responsible and, and yet still improving our educational experience for our kids. So um, I think our, our biggest challenge is really um, at this point, getting everybody back in our schools and um you know that's 
that's where we're going. That's what we're aiming for. So we're all really keeping our fingers crossed um, that, that we'll be able to do that for next school year. So I think really that's our, that's the biggest challenge we're facing at this point. Do you see any federal funding traveling down to the school districts, say the schools across the state? We hear that um, we are in line for another um, round of federal funding. It will probably be around 100,000 for us. Um, and, and actually, um, probably next week, we should be getting the application for that. Um, one of the things that they're warning us is about not using, not using this funding for uh, for staffing positions, because then there would be what they call a cliff eventually, where you'd have all these staff uh, that you're paying fed you're with the federally funded, um, the federal funds, and then, you know, you'd have to get rid of them because the funds disappear. So um, some districts have used a lot of their money for staffing, and we have not gone in that direction. So I, we won't be facing that cliff, but um, there are some districts that are that that will be facing that cliff, and that's that's uh, we ran into that years ago with the ARA funding, um, and that that was a problem. So, but yes, we we know for sure that um, what, that there's going to be about a hundred thousand coming okay. as our as our next round. I haven't heard anything past that. So, okay, thank you. I think that brings us to final comments and questions. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> I hope that everyone, um, that this has been a reminder of the budget process for some and that it's been a kind of a, a 101 for others who haven't been through the budget process um, so far, but um, Anna, can I say something? Yes, Heather. Um, I just, I was gonna say this earlier. Um, I just wanna say thank you again for last year's budget process um, with the pandemic and trying to get our kids into school. Um, the way the town council uh, supported and worked with us and um, as Matt reminded us, some of the projects that got put on hold and I know that you reworked your budget tremendously so that um, we, we could use uh, what we needed to get our kids back in school. I just, um, I, I really appreciate that. And um, I, I, um, I just wanted to mention that. And um, that is us all working together. And um, I just wanna say thank you again for that. That was amazing how um, we came out with a budget that we could be proud of and that could get these kids into school as best as possible, so. I just wanted to acknowledge that. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I think, um, I also wanna say, I think there's an awesome team here. We've got some amazing leaders on both sides. We've got some amazing finance people on both sides, um, working really hard, digging deep, uh, finding grants. Um, if you don't know this already, um, Marcy and Donna and, Matt and John Q, they, they do amazing work finding us money to be found, to be given to us. So um, really grateful for that, so. Are there any other comments or questions? Great. Well, thank you very much for meeting tonight. Matt, do you have any closing comments? I just wanna thank everybody for taking the time out. I know, uh... You know, the, these next four months are uh, a marathon, not a 5K. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions that do arise during the process and uh, feel free to reach out, I'd be happy to be of a resource or uh, uh, if you have a question, I'm happy to, happy to provide any information that you may need. Uh, the second item that I have is uh, just say, I look forward to seeing you all again uh, when we get together with the uh, our auditors on February 10th, which should be a positive event. So looking forward to that as well. So, um, and that's a testament to, to some really great work by uh, Ms. Marcy Weeks, who's uh, with us this evening and John uh, Corderaro and, uh, and all their different staffs. They've done a great job uh, getting us 
to where we are now with the with the audit. So we're looking for an uneventful evening, but one that hopefully uh, will provide you with the information that you need. Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming. It was a great conversation and um, we'll see you on February 10th, if not before. Have a great night. Thank you all, take good care. Thank you.